This video is about the medicine through time section of OCR History GCSE. We're going to start in the prehistoric times. Prehistoric means before writing, and we know about prehistoric history, A, through looking at skeletal remains, and B, because some tribes still live as they did in prehistoric times, or they may have done so up until recently, at which point the explorers would have recorded their way of life, and we can take these recordings and look and think, ah, that's what the tribe does. There's two main types of prehistoric people, hunter-gatherers, who hunt animals, gather food as they travelled, until about 10,000 BC, and farmers, who at 10,000 BC began settling. The farmer is the one on the right, and the hunter-gatherer is the one on the left, in case you can't tell. I apologise for my bad drawings throughout. I was bored. Very bored. The main health problems for prehistoric people were animal attacks, rawr, polluted water supplies, drip, drop, drip, drop, Broken bones, <laughs> arthritis, <laughs> infections, ugh. sickness, bleh. hunting wounds, Pooh. they didn't have guns back then, did they? Lack of food, <laughs> and fatigue. <laughs> the causes, they thought, were animals, <laughs> tripping, <laughs> each other, oh god, John, I hate you, hunger, mm. and god, spirits of the dead, Bad spirits and witches, and the ones in purple are the unnatural ones, and the ones in blue are the natural ones. Sorry about those random noises then, I'm not quite sure what I was doing. I was bored. I've always been bored. I'm a very bored person. Quite a boring person too, actually. Okay, prehistoric health and medicine. The ones in blue again are the natural, and purple the unnatural. They had healers, that were family, women, nature and time, and then God. Charms, medicine men, and a greater being. Whoa. And treatments were herbal remedies, plants, honey, which actually had some special properties, I think, mud, trepanning, which is when they basically like got a rock and smashed it into your head, and they thought all the bad spirits would be able to escape through your skull, but most people bled to death. But some people did survive. Yay for them. Special chants, prayers, and amulets. Moving away from prehistoric times to the Egyptians, and in the top right hand corner there, there's meant to be two pyramids, but they look like they're sort of going into each other. So, sorry. And they made several key developments, specialist doctors, knowledge of the body, ideas about causes of diseases, preventing illness, and everyday treatments. Specialist doctors were trained, which is a start, because in prehistoric times they were just random people, medicine men who had a bone through their nose or something, making them looking special. But these people were actually trained through the study of medical papyri, Papyri? Pa I don't know how you say that. It doesn't really matter, does it? Uh, funded through Egypt's wealth, because Egypt was quite a wealthy nation. They used both natural and supernatural treatments, and you got both specialists and doctors that were general doctors, like GPs. Then you've got the knowledge of the body. So they knew the main organs due to mummification, but because their religion said you're not allowed to study the body, they didn't know their purpose. I think the people that did mummifications were actually kept separate from the rest of society. They were the outcasts. Ooh, scary. And they also made observations from injured soldiers, but they couldn't dissect the bodies again. So, not too far they could go there, but they could see a bit. Like, there's a bit of an organ funny thing there. Don't know. Um, ideas about causes of disease. They developed the natural theory of the channels, where a blocked channel meant disease. Which they could have been right about, actually, because you know the channel in the heart, whatever it's called, pulmonary valve, artery, coronary artery, yes, that one. If that gets blocked, you have a heart attack. So, you know, they were on the right lines. But I think they actually based that on the Nile. And they also had gods they blamed for and prayed to for each illness. So you'd have one god for the cold, and one god for measles, and one god for chicken pox. You must have had a lot of gods. Preventing illness, uh, they washed twice a day, very hygienic, and for meals, and ladies used bronze razors. And I think they wore copper or eye makeup as well. And bronze and copper protect people from disease or something, supposedly. And everyone also had a basic toilet with a basic drainage system. Very nice. And everyday treatments, again, herbal remedies, which we used. Uh, some of them used new ingredients from abroad because people were travelling and stuff. And simple surgery like stitches, bleeding, trepanning, and forced vomiting. Blech! <laughs> I love making sick noises. Apologies for the sick noise. I don't actually like making sick noises that much. In fact, I'm feeling quite ill now. It wasn't a very good idea. Okay, moving on to the Greeks. So there was one big guy in the time of the Greeks, and he was called Hippocrates, and he was a bit of a punk, as you can see on the right. 
He came up with Hippocratic Oath, which basically everyone uses it nowadays. I saw it on Casualty the other day. They mentioned the Hippocratic Oath, and I was like, yeah, I understand something they're talking about. Woo! Uh, yeah, Hippocratic Oath is basically about patient confidentiality and professionalism. And he came up with the theory of the humours, and he thought that an imbalance of the humours caused disease. And I coloured each of his mohawk things a different colour, depending on what humour it refers to. So the red one's blood. The yellow one is yellow bile, the black one's black bile, and the green one is phlegm, I think. And he was also an advocate for natural treatment. He disliked supernatural treatments, which is a step forward, because obviously supernatural treatments don't work. Unless you're really religious, in which case they do work, supposedly. Uh, observing and recording with one of Hippocrates' main big things that he did and he got his doctors to note observations which helped in future diagnosis and that's like an amazing step forward like it's what we do today it's he's just ahead of his time and he also wrote the hippocratic collection of books which contain detailed lists of symptoms and treatments the greeks also went to asclepians to get better and some of them a bit like health spas you know a bit of relaxation time and they would leave a generous offering on the altar for god otherwise known as the greedy priest that ran the place and then they were put to sleep, and they believed that Sleepius cured them. But it wasn't. It was a trained priest. Sorry. And finally, the Greeks had many medical developments, because the doctors dissected bodies in Alexandria, which proved that the brain controlled the body. Very smart. Well done, Greeks. And Greek cities also expected people to keep themselves clean, but they did provide public toilets. Probably nicer than the ones you'd find around here nowadays. We're moving on to the Romans. Now, where did the Romans get their ideas from? Some people say they were stolen. Dun, dun, dun. And some people say they were new. Yay! Okay, stolen ones. Greek doctors travelled abroad and passed on their ideas, and then the Romans might have stolen them from the people that the Greeks passed it on to. I don't know. No one ever will. Does anyone care? Probably not. Romans took over the Greek medical library in Alexandria, so they could get all the ideas that the Greeks written down in their library. I think the Hippocratic collection of books was probably in there as well, so just taking it. Yep, next one down. Many of the books that the Roman studies were written by Greeks. And the Roman Empire was large, so they easily took the Greek ideas. Such a big area of land, you've got a few Greeks dotted about in here, kidnap them, force them to tell you like all their medical secrets, problem solved. But you know, maybe we're being too harsh on the Romans, there are many arguments that they came up with the ideas themselves because Romans were skilled engineers so they built sewage systems and baths and that was all them because it wasn't the Greeks because the Greeks are dead I think actually no I think the Greeks were there at the same time as the Romans I'm not really sure about time period the Roman government helped people to treat disease so might have provided some services like I think the baths they provided they're really cheap and the Roman army was large and they developed ideas to keep it healthy which the Greeks didn't do even though they had a large army that's a really bad point Apologies. Moving on to the Roman Galen now. No one really likes Galen. He was a bit of an idiot, if you ask me. But you didn't. So sorry for giving you my opinion. Galen was trusted due to his excellent showmanship and his role as the emperor's doctor. He had experience from studying in Alexandria and treating gladiator wounds. He wrote convincing books, which happened to be all wrong, which became the basis of medical teaching for 1,500 years. He stole some of Hippocrates' ideas. Theft. Ugh. He looked for natural causes of diseases. So, you know, that's one thing we can clap him for, but so did Hippocrates, so Hippocrates wins. He encouraged observing and recording, so did Hippocrates, and he proved his theories in public. One time he wanted to prove that cutting nerves led to pain or something, and he got a pig and he cut different nerves and the pig kept squealing. That is called animal cruelty. NSPCC, is that what it's called? No, that's the kids' charity, wrong one. RSPCA, is that the one? I'm not, I'm not really sure of charities, but that one. They, they need to get in touch, definitely. So why did Romans introduce public health? They wanted to prevent the spread of disease in their cities to make it sound strong and feel awesome and stuff. They needed a healthy army and healthy workers for trading to build up their excellent empire and to show off their skilled engineers and architects and their great wealth. The Roman public health system was very organised and advanced, provided everyone with fresh water, which is something that no other health system had done, had an impact on general health, supported the Roman lifestyle, especially the baths where people could have their business meetings, naked in the baths, isn't that a great way to do business deals, uh, removed the waste and benefited both the rich and the poor, so it didn't just help the rich, helped everyone, nice and kind of them. 
The weaknesses were that the waste sometimes got stuck and that led to a build-up and everything stunk. Ugh. Lead pipes led to lead poisoning. I love that. There's three leads in one sentence. <laughs> I'm easily amused. Sewage was put into rivers that people drank from. I'm sorry, that is disgusting. Water was only changed weekly in the baths. Go at the start of the week if I were you. Ugh. Soldiers still spread diseases. And wastewater was thrown out of windows. It's a great opportunity to, you know, get one back on your neighbour. If you, like, had an argument, out goes the waste onto his head. I thought I'd make this slide look more pretty with some different display, but turns out you can't actually read it, so sorry. Uh, the war had a quite a big impact on Romans. Uh, the war disrupted knowledge and communications, and the money was spent on war and not education, so people weren't trained as well, doctors sort of lost touch. The war destroyed the library, which is always very sad to see books burn, and it also destroyed existing public health systems. And there was no engineers, because everyone was fighting, so there was no public health, basically. But look on the bright side, war is practice! So we get to practice on all these dead people. Yay! Okay, do so moving on to the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, healers tended to be family, priests, surgeons and doctors. And the surgeons and doctors had improved slightly since the prehistoric time, but aside from that, not much had changed. Public health left people alone, filthy towns and disease spread like a wildfire. Uh, they had knowledge of the main organs and knowledge of bones, and they dissected for proof, and there weren't religious barriers now to dissecting as there were in the Egyptian times. Treatments. They used herbs, they used prayers and charms, the theory of the opposite, and rest and di exercise and diet. Which, that's quite sensible, the exercise and diet. And I quite like the rest. <laughs> surgery. They had simple surgery, casts and splints. Still haven't got rid of trepanning though, but they had natural anaesthetics and natural antiseptics. I think they used opium for an anaesthetic. Drug of the day. And of the course is they still had God and amounts of the humours. Religion had a major impact on medicine and health, and there was two major religions that we're going to focus on, and that's Christianity and Islam. Christianity was more in Europe, and Islam was more in Asia, I think. So Christianity, they trained physicians in university, used herbal remedies, had nuns to care for the sick, used monks to copy out Galen the Twat's books, and preserved knowledge from the past, and didn't question ancient writings. And there's a cross to represent Christianity. Islam, they cared for the sick in established hospitals, developed medical education, which was very advanced for the time, translated Greek medical books, which preserved it for many years, had a huge medical encyclopedias, studied ancient works, and had an excellent medical library. Have I put that one down twice? No, I haven't. And there's the Islam symbol. So what did people believe caused disease? They thought the god and the devil were to blame. They believed that God sent illness as a punishment, and they believed that elves and spirits shot arrows to cause everyday disease, which sounds really cute and happy and cheerful, but it's actually kind of freaky if you think about it. They believed that illness occurred when the four humours were out of balance, and their respective physicians who studied this stuff about the humours in Greek books in their university training. They also used some common sense and blamed bad air and filthy streets for illness, and they believed that worms, like Frederick at the bottom of the screen there, caused diseases. Then they came to desperate explanations, such as blaming minority groups, such as Jews, and blaming outrageous fashion. I'm not going to lie, when I see people in really tight, black, tight things, with no shorts or trousers or anything, I feel sick. So maybe they were going on something there. Healers in the Middle Ages were at a variety of prices. If you were really rich, you could have a physician. They diagnosed illnesses by using urine charts. I think they were a bit obsessed with urine. They had urine charts, they tasted the urine, they tested the urine, and they examined the urine. Mmm, urine. Oh, that's a bit grim. I sound a bit freaky then. Sorry. I don't actually like urine. They do. And they also timed their treatments to coincide with the movements of the planets, a bit like Harry Potter centaurs. If you couldn't afford a physician, you could have a surgeon. They were less expensive and not quite so obsessed with urine. Surgeons carried out bleeding treatments using bleeding cups and leeches. Mmm, leeches. And if you were really like poor, you could have a home remedy. That was herbal remedies, which were passed down through generations. Some of these were helpful and some weren't so helpful. And home remedies are probably better than all the ones you'd pay for, so... 
Yay, poor people. Okie do, so moving on to what types of surgery there were. You could remove arrowheads, remove blown splinters from the brain, which I think is quite advanced. I don't know why you'd have blown splinters in the brain, it's a bit freaky, but they did. Removing bones from the bladder, removing tumours and cauterizing, which is when you use boiling hot oil to seal blood vessels. It's not very nice. I've heard it's highly painful. And there were some big developments, like the invention of instruments such as forceps. That image is meant to be a pair of forceps. I'm sorry, I, I've not given birth, so I don't know what forceps look like. But I made a guess, and I don't know. It doesn't really look right, does it? Then they had the wound man chart, which showed how to deal with different wounds. Natural anaesthetics. Oh, this is where the opium is. Sorry, there was an opium earlier. Whoops. Sorry. I hope I haven't confused anyone. And natural uh, antiseptics such as wine and honey were used. And Galen was finally challenged. Woo! Through practical experiments. Go on. I sound like I'm full on getting into this history. I've just made too many revision videos. I think this is my eighth revision video. And I'm trying to liven them up a bit. Because they, they're all a bit dull. So I thought I'd put some pictures in. A bit of excitement. Yeah, involvement. Woo! Okay, the Middle Ages. So there were some problems with the public health, unfortunately. Waste was dropped in the streets, but the solution was rakers. Woo! Best job in the world, not gonna lie. Then we have the open sewers, and they smelled awful. And people fell in, or were pushed in. And so what could we do? We have drains over the like open sewers so that people can't fall in. And you can have private toilets over rivers. So literally you'd have your own toilet box over the river and you'd go into it and sit on top of the river and your mess would fall out through the bottom and everyone could see it. And it would go into the river. How nice. Butchers threw out smelly waste and laws were passed to punish them. Animals in the streets. Obviously, you know, you don't want cows wandering down the road. Uh, so you'd have specific areas designed for animals or designated for animals, either or. There was overcrowding which led to the spread of disease. They say there's no solution. I say you just kill people. That's not a very nice solution. I say no solution. Then you have contaminated water supply and you could line the cesspits to prevent leakages. Isn't that pleasant? Moving on to la renaissance. It means the rebirth or something. I did a whole exam on the renaissance once and it was awful. And I failed. <laughs> okay. There were many key breakthroughs in the Renaissance. The first one was drawings by Leonardo da Vinci. The thing on the right, it was meant to be a Mona Lisa, but it went a bit wrong, so I sort of changed it into a different picture of an alien, and it still looks awful. And Leonardo da Vinci, because he wanted to draw all those people and draw how they worked and stuff, he encouraged artists to dissect bodies to understand the movement so you could get the perfect image. He also identified differences between the genders. Oh, isn't that so smart of him? As if no one had ever noticed before, really. And it also showed that some people were willing to challenge the church, like, yeah, we're going to dissect, we don't care what you say. Go on, Leonardo. The printing press was also invented, which enabled mass production of books and images, meaning that medical ideas can be communicated more easily and much wider. Guns and gunpowder pow, pow, were invented, and they caused deep gunshot wounds, which may have killed a few people, but it meant that surgeons could examine them and look deeper into the body. And they also used technology to make guns and gunpowder that could be used in medicine. And finally, microscopes, which allowed scientists to see things that were previously invisible, and that led to the discovery of microorganisms, which have changed life as we know it. There's three main people in the Renaissance. There's Vesalius, there's Paré, and there's Harvey. Okay, Vesalius was born in 1514 and died in 1564, so he had a very short life of only 50 years. There's a picture of him on the right. His ear looks like it's in the wrong place, and he looks a bit paedophilic. He has no eyebrows, and all of his eye is blue. I cannot draw. He wrote The Fabric of the Human Body in 1543, and he was a professor of surgery in Padua. He proved Galen wrong, which showed that Galen couldn't be entirely trusted. <coughs> well done, Vesalius. He also showed that doctors could learn more about anatomy by dissecting humans. So in the short term, he proved Galen wrong. Woo! And in the long term, people developed an inquiry attitude using dissection and books. Unfortunately, there were a few limitations, because doctors refused to accept that Galen was wrong, because they were just twats. And no one was healthier as a result of Vesalius's work, which is a bit disappointing. And Zinviave Paré 
who looks very dapper in his moustache. He was born in 1510, and I can't do accents, so I'm going to stop, and died in 1590. He worked as an army surgeon and became surgeon to kings of France. He wrote many books, such as Apology and Treaties, which sounds like a fascinating read. He treated wounds using his own ointment, which contained alcohol, because he ran out of the oil he needed for cauterization, and because he, he treated them, and then he was like, what should I do? And so he used ligatures, which is when you get bits of thread and you tie them around the end of the blood vessels to stop blood from escaping, but they take forever, and they sound really painful. Anyway, and he also designed false limbs for those that had lost limbs. In the short term, it was better initial treatment with less pain and a higher survival rate, and a better quality of life for false limb recipients who could pretend that they had never lost their limb in the first place. In the long term, ligatures were used instead of boiling oil, and a more inquiry occurred because his work showed that inquiry had its benefits. False limbs have also become increasingly more developed. I mean, the false limbs today are just awesome. I really want one. Well, I don't, but if I ever lose an arm, I want one. Okay, there's many limitations of ligatures, unfortunately. They're slow and dangerous, and the thread can cause infection. Ugh. And now we have Harvey with his little quiff. He was born in 1578 and died in 1657. He studied medicine in Cambridge and Padua, so very well educated. Worked as a doctor in London for a while and as a doctor to King Charles I, making him very well respected. He wrote a book with a very long name called An Anatomical Account of the Motion of the Heart and Blood. Sorry, that was bad pronunciation there. In 1628. And he proved that the heart acts as a pump. So it pumps the blood around the body in a one-way system. And he did this through dissecting things. And then he measured the quantity of blood that like, went around the body and worked out that it was the same blood being pumped through the body. And that stopped bleeding long term. So in the short term, he did promote dissection. He showed how the heart muscles work. And he proved Galen wrong. Get in there, Harvey. And long term, he stopped bleedings, which is really good because they were pointless and probably quite painful. And he also laid the groundwork with huge discoveries about blood. But then again, no one was healthier as a result of Harvey's work. In the Renaissance, there were four main everyday treatments. Bleeding, herbal remedies, new ingredients from abroad, and the Bezos stone, which is an, sort of an example. Bleeding was one of the most common medical treatments used to cure illness. Part of the theory of the opposite, you know, you've got too much blood, we'll take some away. Herbal remedies, they were just passed down for generations, and mothers told daughters, and after a while they started writing them down as more and more people became literate. But sometimes they did unknowingly use ingredients like honey, which killed bacteria, so the remedies might have actually worked, they just didn't know why. Then we got lots of new ingredients from abroad, because European travels abroad brought new ingredients to the country, which could be used in treatments, and some of them were effective, and some weren't so effective. And finally, the bezel stone. Uh, this is an example of basically the work of a quack, which we come on to quite soon. But a visitor to King Charles gave him a bezel stone, See top right hand corner, yes it looks like a very nice cookie, it's not, it's a bezel stone, which is a stone taken from the stomach of a goat that will cure all poisons. Haha, <laughs> Harry Potter memes. Uh, Parry said that it wouldn't work and it's just a live experiment, well done Parry. So an evil cook who had like, murdered loads of people or something like that was given some poison and a bezel stone, but he died. How sad. Rip. And this was good for experiments and inquiry because it proved they were very useful, because otherwise King Charles might have had some poison and then had the bezel stone and died. And that would have just been terrible. So when you're ill, you've got a choice of three people you can go to. Physicians, quacks, and female healers. Physicians were trained in universities in the writing of Greeks, Celius, Harvey, and Paré. They were advised good diet and exercise to stay healthy. So they got some stuff right. And they also watched dissections, but unfortunately they were animal dissections, which could present a few problems, obviously, because humans and sheep aren't exactly the same. And then there's quacks, which were untrained healers who tried to make as much money as possible by selling charms, potions, bottles of medicine that they claimed did an amazing trick, and they didn't, so don't get fooled by quacks. And there's women healers, who are wealthy women who read Galen and Ibn Sina, and they would treat local families, but they weren't allowed to go to university, and because they hadn't been to university, they weren't allowed to choose some equipment like forceps, but I think women healers were quite good midwives. Public health in the Renaissance still wasn't that good. There was many outbreaks of plague across the country due to towns being overcrowded and full of dirt, and the government had a few hygiene rules, but they didn't do much to enforce them. 
the causes, there was still quite a variety of ideas about causes. Some blamed God, and the government ordered a day of public prayer for forgiveness from God because they thought he had sent the plague as a punishment for sins. Some people blamed the movements of the planets and bad air. And some sensible people blamed dirt and overcrowding. Well done, you got it right. So how did they prevent the plague from spreading in the Renaissance? The doctors had no cures and many physicians left London. Scared. Many victims were put into quarantine, which is actually quite sensible, prevents contact and people touching and stuff. And no animals were allowed inside the city. And everyone had to sweep the street outside their house, which made the whole area a bit nicer and more hygienic. Moving on now to the Industrial Revolution. There's quite a few changes from prehistoric times to the Industrial Revolution, and all the new stuff's in purple. Okay, so they still believed in gods and spirits and that they caused disease, the four humours, bad air. But then they also came up with a theory of the block channels and planets and stars. Treatments, they came up with herbal remedies, prayers, bleeding and purging, rest, exercise and diet, which they had both in prehistoric times and in the Industrial Revolution. Surgery was simple surgery, splints, antiseptics, which were new, anaesthetics, which were new, cauterising, which was new, military surgeons, which were new, and ligatures, which were new. Public health, people still took care of themselves, poorly enforced laws, but we had aqueduct sewers which took all the uh, messy stuff from our toilet down the drain, so that was quite good, and we have the baths, and that's quite a good thing to have as well. Edward Jenner was born in 1749 and died in 1823. Smallpox was a disease that was sort of around in his time, and it killed many people, which was really sad for them. And inoculations were used to kill smallpox, and they were expensive and dangerous. Jenna discovered vaccinations using cowpox to protect people against smallpox, and he published his findings, and vaccines did cure people. But unfortunately, people were opposed to vaccines, A, because they were time-consuming to administer, B, because they didn't trust country Dr. Jenna, C, because they thought it was against God's will to give a human and animal disease, D, because people thought that God sent smallpox as a punishment for sins, and that people that get vaccinations are just being let off. Uh, I think we're on E now, aren't we? One, two, three, four. E, people didn't like to what they were doing by the government. And F, inoculators thought that the vaccinations would put them out of business because they wouldn't be able to inoculate people anymore. So what did the future hold for Jenner and smallpox? Jenner proved that diseases could be treated worldwide, promoting experiment and inquiry. And his vaccines were also used worldwide. And in 1980s, smallpox was declared eradicated from the world. Well done, Jenna. We're moving on now to the 1800s and 1900s, which is what pretty much the rest of this video is about. So, in the 1800s and 1900s, they believed that disease was caused by the spontaneous generation of bacteria inside meat and bad air and miasma. Spontaneous generation is when the meat sort of went off and they believed that these bacteria just came up from nowhere. So, they were a bit weird. Uh, anyway, and in the fight against disease, there were many key people. There was Louis Pasteur who proved that bacteria caused diseases, which allowed cause to be developed. Robert Koch identified specific bacteria, allowing individual cures to be developed. Pasteur again, who developed vaccinations to prevent individual diseases. Ehrlich and Domach, who were the first chemical cures to attack bacteria, and they called them the magic bullets. Fleming Florian Chain developed antibiotics, making most diseases treatable, uh, namely penicillin with them. And Crick and Watson, discovered DNA, which allowed treatments for genetic diseases to come about. Yay! So now it's the Battle of the Greats, Pasta versus Cock. It's quite hard to keep this serious. From 1857 to 1865, Pasta proved that... <laughs> Pasta... <laughs> proved that germs in the air caused liquids to go sour using improved technology. From 1873 to 1880, Cock identified different bacteria through staining and photography using improved equipment like conical flasks. From 1879 to 1881, Pasta worked... <laughs> Pasta... <laughs> it's not even the name you meant to find funny. Pasta worked out how vaccines worked. And then from 1880 to 1882, Cock discovered which bacteria cause which diseases using a microscope. In case you can't tell, that thing I drew is meant to be a microscope. It's not very good, and I didn't take it out GCSE, and that is why. And I hated art. From 1881 to 1885, Pasta tested 
faster tested vaccination theory and published it, which allowed other vaccines to be developed, which was amazing. So in the end, I think Pasta won, but you know, you might be a cock supporter. I don't know. Sorry if I was speaking up quietly then, we've got visitors over and I thought they might be a bit freaked out if they heard me talking about and battle between pasta and cock. So moving on to the first antibiotics, penicillin. Joseph Lister uh, was a scientist, I think his name sounds English but he probably wasn't, we don't do much in England. In 1872 he noticed a mould of penicillin bacteria that killed all the bacteria surrounding it. And in 1884 he used this mould to treat a nurse for an infected wound. And then he didn't do it, anything else with it. He never used it again. So that was Joseph Lister's pointless life for you. It, it, it wasn't pointless. It was very good life. Okay, um, Alexander Fleming in 18, 1918, he studied soldiers' wounds infected with different bacteria. In 1828, he went on holiday and left a pile of petri dishes which contained bacteria. He returned to discover mould which killed surrounding bacteria. He carried out experiments using diluted penicillin to kill bacteria but leave cells healthy. Then he made a list of the germs it killed and treated an infection. But then he found it was too law hard to make lots of it so he stopped. But in 1929 he did write about penicillin in a medical journal which was discovered in 1938 by Florian Chain who were researching into how germs could be killed. They received funding from America, because Britain was too poor, to develop penicillin. And in 1941 they used penicillin to treat a patient. But then they ran out, so he died. Unfortunate. Then in the war, Florian Chain mass-produced penicillin, producing 2.3 million doses. That's a lot of penicillin. So what were conditions like in the early 1800s? There was lots of overcrowding due to an increase in factory jobs and lack of railways and everyone wanted a job so everyone came to the cities and then there was too many people. Then there was high death rates due to widespread disease due to overcrowding. Also high death rates due to cholera epidemic due to contaminated water. Streets were filled with waste products. Smelly! As the government didn't hire cleaners. There was smoke coming from the factories which made lots of people ill because there was no industrial laws on how you had to act and how much smoke you were allowed to release and stuff. The lack of sewers was disgusting. It smelt bad, people were throwing stuff onto the streets, and that was because there was no laws which forced councils to provide fresh water and sewers and stuff. There was a lack of doctors for the poor because they weren't paid by the government, so only go to the doctors if you could afford it. And food was adulterated with harmful substances by shopkeepers who wanted to increase their weight to increase profits. And then that led to people getting ill if they took in the harmful substances. Okie do, so in the 1800s, Edwin Chadwick was the big guy, born in 1800, died in 1890, nice long life, 90 years, quite attractive looking with his nice wig there and yellow eyes, he looks like a vampire. He's related to Edward Cullen, you can tell. Okay, so he wrote a report, basically, and how did this all come about? Well, he noticed the problems associated with the poor public health. So the poor lived in dirty, overcrowded cities, leading to a mass spread of disease. And people were too sick to work, so others had to pay higher taxes to help them out. He came up with some solutions. To improve drainage and sewers, provide clean water, to remove refuse from the street, and appoint medical officers in each area to enforce this. And then, in 1848... It was Public Health Act number one, woo, which was introduced to combat the 1848 cholera outbreak with public health improvements. It set up a national board of health with towns choosing to have or not to have, in their case, you can choose if you want one or not, a medical officer of health. And it gave local councils the option of collecting taxes to pay for reforms. You didn't have to. So, in 1875, they came up with a new Public Health Act which forced all councils to appoint a medical officer's help and provide clean water. They were sort of stimulated to do this following the outbreaks of cholera in 1853 and 1865. So what was the result? Well, by 1900, people lived longer, healthier lives. And I think Edward and Chatwick did get, um, what's its face? Knighted or something. But he only got knighted the year before he died, so we didn't get to be a knight for long. Sucks to be him. Sorry about all this writing, it does get less quite soon, I hope. Uh, Edwin Chadwick was really important, obviously. He produced evidence supporting reforms, paying people reform when needed, made recommendations, basis for the 1848 Public Health Act. But his report didn't need to immediate reforms, and his first act was relatively unsuccessful because not all councils had to comply with the regulations. You obviously know all about him from the last slide. William Farr, another really important figure, used information on births and deaths to show where the death rate was highest. He used his figures to prove a link between bad living conditions and high death rate. 
and he wrote a report which put pressure on local governments to make changes and his report also shamed some towns into making changes because they were like, oh my god, this is so embarrassing, we have to change this. But unfortunately only some of the towns responded to the report and there was no massive overall change. And then there was John Snow who published a book in 1849 which stated that cholera was spread through water. He wrote a report on the Broad Street Pump, which was a pump that lots of people got water from and everyone that got water from got cholera because there was a cesspool like leaking into it, which is very grim. And he blamed dirty water for disease. Unfortunately, his report didn't lead to a public health act and scientists didn't believe him. Well, bet they're ashamed now. Be embarrassed, guys. God. There were two other main factors that led to public health reforms, and they were cholera, which spread across Europe in 1847, causing many deaths which frightened Britain and scared the government into trying to improve public health to stop all these deaths. Unfortunately, the act wasn't compulsory, and the National Board of Health was abolished. And then there was the Great Stink, which occurred in the hot summer of 1858, in which the Thames began to smell. It was in London, and it reached the Houses of Parliament, and then all the MPs were like, ooh, that smells bad. And that led to London building an effective modern sewage system. And they hired this guy to like design it all, and it was really posh. And unfortunately, there was no public health act to spread improvements throughout England, so only the people in London really benefited. So, ha, huh, sucks for everyone else. In the 1800s and 1900s, conservatism is one of the main things that held people back. Because people wanted to keep everything all the same. And if you keep medicine the same, you couldn't make improvements. But then Pasteur's germ theory, which was published in 1865, contained scientific proof which persuaded people that change was needed. And this led to a decrease in protests against tax increases to cover these costs, and lots of times made local changes. And if you make a few changes, then you may as well make more and more changes, and people see, oh, change is good, and then they try to make changes, and just improves the whole area. And also changing voting patterns, because before 1867, only wealthy men who didn't want to pay more tax voted. So the government would say, no, we're not going to put tax up, we're not going to improve public health screen, because if we like introduce a public health scheme, then you'll have to pay more tax and you won't vote for us. But then in 1867, working men in towns were allowed to vote, and the government wanted to keep all voters happy, and it introduced the Public Health Act of 1875. And I think a few years later, I'm not quite sure what the date was, but um, then everyone, working men everywhere, got the vote. And then obviously much later, women got the vote, and prisoners lost the vote. So the big Public Health Act of 1875 led to some big changes. Housing standards improved, pollution of rivers was stopped, working hours in factory were reduced, ingredients that made food and healthy were made illegal, and education became compulsory. I'm not quite sure what that picture's of, but I forgot to colour the windows in and it's really annoying me. <laughs> Technology made the cleaner possible, but how far did it make it possible? Well, there were sewers, which required hard engineering work, technology, and steam engines to make them, because steam engines made making the sewers so much easier. Lavatories, or toilets as you and I call them. Though I used to call them lavatories, I go to the teacher like, oh, can I go to the lavatory please? And then I realised I sounded like a twat. And they used well-designed flushing systems. And soap, which was designed carefully to kill bacteria. I don't even know if it was, I made that up, I just didn't know what to put. But yeah, and there's a picture of some soap. And how much did reforms improve people's lives? Well, they led to an increased life expectancy and a decreased infant death rate. But a third of families couldn't pay for essentials, many worked on low wages, and the sick, unemployed and elderly received no government help. So, it sucks to be them. I swear in this video I have said it sucks to be everyone. Sorry. So now we have six different things that happened showing how successful the public health reforms were. In 1902, training became compulsory for midwives, so all midwives were trained so you wouldn't have some random woman looking after your baby or whatever midwives do. In 1906, children in need got free school meals. In 1907, it became compulsory for people to notify births to the local medical officer of health. In 1908, people over 70 were given an old age pension. Unfortunately, their life expectancy wasn't that great, so they probably died after, like, a few months. In 1909, back-to-back -back housing was banned, so you couldn't really, you know, bang on your door anymore to disturb the neighbours. In 1912, clinics were held in school to give children free medical treatment, so your kid wouldn't come home diseased. The introduction of national insurance was really important. Workers, employers and the government all paid into a sickness fund, 
and ill workers were given 10 shillings a week and free medical care for 26 weeks, which was really good because it got them back to health, promoted the economy because if we had loads of sick workers, then obviously we wouldn't be able to keep producing as many goods. But if we're looking after these sick workers and allowing them to get back to health, then we get the workers back sooner. Unfortunately, the national insurance only included people in work and excluded most women and children who didn't have jobs. And it didn't cover those with long-lasting illnesses, because if you were ill for over 26 weeks, well, tough luck. In the 1930s, returning soldiers were given homes by the government, and the councils provided good quality houses for people to rent. Dangerous slum houses were cleared. The rise in unemployment in the 1930s, probably due to the Wall Street crash, led to less people being covered by national insurance, and many people in jobs couldn't afford to keep up with their payments. After the Second World War, things changed a lot, because during the Second World War, people got free health care in the war to keep them fit for war effort, and evacuations led to the middle class being shocked at the conditions of city children. So after the sacrifices of the war, people wanted a better future. And there was the all-in-this-together approach. So everyone was like, yeah, we're all going to work together and get better and healthy and everything. So nice and happy, smiley, family, yay, England. Beveridge was a civil servant who wrote a report on how to improve people's lives. His key recommendations included setting up a free national health service, turning medical workers into government employees, and setting up national insurance. The NHS report was greeted with enthusiasm by many people. It sold 600,000 copies. That's a lot of copies. God, is that platinum or something? I don't know. It was met by some opposition from doctors who thought they would earn less because they wouldn't be able to have private patients. But then Beveridge was like, no, you can still have private patients, but you've got public patients too. And some people thought that other people would get lazy because they got free healthcare. Like, oh, we don't have to work. You can just lay back and not do anything and still get free healthcare. The NHS officially opened on the 5th of July... 1948. That year is really important. I bet that will come up in some question. 1948. Ooh. Anyway, and after this, life expectancy increased dramatically because medical training increased. In 1960s, lots of hospitals were built. And in the 1970s, there was loads of campaigns for people's health, like stop smoking or don't drink alcohol, or whatever they had back then. Anaesthetics are used to numb pain, and they developed throughout the 19th century. At the start of the 19th century, they didn't really have an anaesthetic, they just had working fast. And the lesson we had at school, they called this speed, and I thought they meant the drug, so I was really confused for the whole lesson. Anyway, if you're working fast, you don't take any chemicals, and unfortunately it's really dangerous, because working fast led to mistakes. There was one guy that got his testicles chopped off. Very unfortunate. Laughing gas was taken after this, it was developed, because people realised it reduced pain, but it didn't make the patient unconscious, and the right amount had to be used. As an unsuccessful demonstration showed, they were trying to show off, like, ah, check us, laughing gas works so well. And it didn't work, and the patient was there screaming in agony. Ether was very effective, but it irritated the eyes and lungs, and could catch fire, I think it was quite heavy to drag around as well. Chloroform was discovered for use as a very effective anaesthetic by James Simpson. And you sort of soaked a cloth in it or something and stuck it over the patient's face as shown in that image there yes this does sound a bit like attempt to kidnap doctors were unsure of the doses at first led to overdoses i think someone died after having their toenail removed why do they have to have anesthetic for that i don't know but they died and doctors felt they had the time to attempt complex surgery because they had all the patients knocked out unfortunately their complex surgery often failed and so the patients died which led to people being like oh we're not so sure about this I think it was chlorothon that was used on the Queen when she was giving birth. I believe that was Queen Victoria. Antiseptics were developed to kill germs so they didn't infect operating wounds, but it took quite a while to develop because until Pasteur published his germ theory, no one actually knew what caused disease, and people didn't wash hands or sterilise equipment before operating, and that was grim. Joseph Lister discovered the use of cobolic acid as an antiseptic in the 1860s, and he applied cobolic acids to wounds and used soak bandages, and he trained young surgeons to follow his ideas. But carbolic acid did cause corrosion, made it hard to breathe, so you had to sort of go to the window and stand there and breathe in. And you look a bit lazy, you look like you've gone for a little look out the window. Uh, surgeons didn't actually believe in germs, and they still used speed, which led to bleeding. And other surgeons thought that Lister was an arrogant fanatic, so they didn't really believe him. Aseptic surgery developed after that to include treating operative 
instruments with steam, and the development of rubber gloves by William Halstead, and there's a really cute love story related to that, because William Halstead had this nurse that he was like, oh, you're hot, and um, she had problems with her hands due to the corrosive carbolic acid, so he asked some like rubber company to make her some gloves, and then he gave them to her, and then they fell in love and got married. Isn't that so cute? Yeah. Much better love story than Twilight. There's actually been many developments in surgery since 1900, like x-rays, which allow breaks and fractures in bones to be seen and corrected, I'm sure you know all about them, blood transfusions, which means that if someone's bleeding to death you can give them some blood, and you couldn't do that before because people didn't know what blood groups there were, so it was really confusing, but in 1901 someone discovered blood groups, so well done to the person who discovered blood groups. Uh, fighting infection, treatment improved through practice, people knew what to do, they were more sterile, more aseptic, that sort of thing. Radiotherapy was developed, which is used to diagnose and treat cancers. Plastic surgery, which led to rapid improvements you know, in techniques, and it's much less risky now. So if you've got a nose that's a bit, you know, off-centre, you can correct it. Unless you're Aloy's midgen. Harry Potter joke there. Transplants. Lots of different organs can now be transplanted. You can have heart transplants, kidney transplants, lung transplants. Can you? I don't know. I'm making this up. We could also have bone marrow transplants, which are really good for treating some diseases. The quality of anaesthetics has definitely improved. It can be injected into the bloodstream using massive needles. They did that when they took out one of my teeth. It wasn't a bad tooth, it was just... It wasn't even a proper... I don't know why they had to do it. All they did was take out some milk tooth that was gone wonky. Really pointless. Anyway, sorry, you don't really want to know about my dental issues. And you can also have local anaesthetics now, which is really useful because the patient doesn't be knocked out. And then there's keyhole and microsurgery, which uses a smaller hole, decreasing the risk of infection. And you can also use cameras and stuff now, so you can see into the body and do much better surgery. And it's the last slide. Yeah! And it's all about women, because there wasn't enough about them in the rest of the thing. I don't think there was anything about them. And so I tried to make it all nice and girly, but I forgot to colour Mary Seacole, like her title in, and it's really annoying me. But I think it looks nicer like that, because the pink one looks a bit too pink. Anyway, Florence Nightingale, 1820 to 1910, travelled to the Crimea with 38 others after training in Germany. She was appalled by army hospitals and concentrated on cleaning them up. She returned as a national heroine. Everyone knows her, the lady with the lamp. I think that's the right person there. And she set up her own nursing school, promoting hygiene. Yeah, so everyone bums off her still, and it's like really unfair because no one talks about Mary Sequel. And cleanliness did continue after she died, and conditions improved dramatically. Thank you very much, Florence. Then, 1805 to 1881, we had Mary Seacole, who was born in Jamaica to a local healer. She paid her way to Crimea, because the British refused to pay for her to go, and she provided for soldiers. She treated wounds on the battlefield. She returned to England bankrupt and tried to get funding, but the company she was going to get funding with went bankrupt like her <laughs> so she couldn't get any money and to try to get some money she wrote a book and Mary Seacole improved the practical skills of many nurses and improved hygiene at war but she was never treated with the same respect as Florence Nightingale I mean a lot of people haven't heard of her so that's awesome that's all about females in case you didn't know awesome that's the end of the video so we've got traditional balloons flying across the screen to celebrate woo and, I don't know, I bet no one's actually got to the end of the video, like, died of boredom. If anyone has actually got here, then I'm sorry if I've bored you to death with my bad jokes. And, I don't know, I hope it helped.